I'm Eric Strong from the Palo Alto Veterans Hospital and Stanford University. Today, I will be discussing the physical exam findings of aortic regurgitation. The learning objectives of this talk include the knowledge of both the common and not so common physical findings which have been described in aortic regurgitation, an understanding of the differences in exam between acute aortic regurgitation and chronic aortic regurgitation, and lastly, the knowledge of the test characteristics of these findings. Such knowledge of the test characteristics will allow the physician to more accurately apply the presence or absence of specific findings to a clinical determination of the probability of the presence or absence of aortic regurgitation in a particular patient. I would like to start with this quote from the usually reliable up-to-date. Quote, the physical examination in patients with chronic aortic regurgitation is often dramatic and frequently establishes the diagnosis without the need for laboratory testing. This opinion is shared by a significant portion of experienced clinicians, but I hope you see by the end of this talk that this may be an overzealous endorsement of the strength of the physical exam in this particular situation. The physical findings of aortic regurgitation can be clearly divided into two categories. First, abnormal heart sounds and murmurs detected during cardiac auscultation, and the second, palpable or observable findings caused by the bounding pulses. As a general rule, patients with acute aortic regurgitation and chronic aortic regurgitation present quite differently. Acute AR usually manifests as hypotension or even frank cardiogenic shock. The classic abnormalities on auscultation may be overshadowed by findings of acute cardiac failure. In addition, the findings directly related to bounding pulses are almost always absent in acute AR, as the left ventricle has not yet had an opportunity to adapt or to hypertrophy to the point where it can generate the high systolic pressure necessary for vigorous arterial pulsations. Therefore, the forthcoming information applies almost solely to patients with chronic AR. There are essentially four different abnormalities that may be heard on cardiac auscultation. The following order represents my own impression of the frequency with which these are heard. The most common abnormality is a systolic murmur, frequently crescendo-decrescendo, that is heard at the upper sternal border, and which actually sounds a little like aortic stenosis. This surprises less experienced clinicians who don't initially realize that with a significant amount of the stroke volume falling backwards into the LV during diastole, the LV must eject that much more blood during systole in order to maintain cardiac output. This increased forward flow of blood generates turbulence across the aortic valve during systole and creates a murmur mimicking aortic stenosis. Because the murmur is caused solely by increased blood flow, it is frequently referred to as a systolic floor murmur. The next most common abnormality is an abnormal S2. Specifically, the aortic component of the second heart sound may be either unusually loud or unusually soft, while the pulmonary component of the second heart sound is often loud as a consequence of secondary pulmonary hypertension. Next is the classic diastolic blowing decrescendo murmur heard at the upper sternal border. understand why this murmur has the characteristics it does, let's take a look at an intracardiac pressure tracing. Here the left ventricular pressure is in blue, aortic pressure is in green, and left atrial pressure is in red. During diastole, there exists a pressure gradient between the aorta and the left ventricle. As blood flows backwards across the aortic valve into the LV, the LV pressure rises as the aortic pressure falls. Thus, this pressure gradient diminishes over the course of diastole. As the intensity of a murmur is partly dependent upon the pressure gradient driving the turbulent blood flow, this leads to the decrescendo shape of this classic murmur. Take a listen. This murmur is sometimes easier to hear with a patient sitting upright and leaning slightly forward, and can be further accentuated by isometric hand grip, which increases afterload, 
and thus increases the pressure gradient driving regurgitation. The classic murmur of AR may be indistinguishable at the bedside from that caused by pulmonary regurgitation in the setting of extreme pulmonary hypertension. Finally, the least common abnormality to auscultate is a late diastolic rumbling at the apex. This murmur sounds like mitral stenosis, except that the patients in whom it occurs have morphologically normal mitral valves. This is the Austin Flint murmur, named after the physician who first described it as a blubbering presystolic murmur. Flint's original explanation for the murmur, which is still the leading theory, is that the regurgitant jet impinges on one of the mitral valve leaflets, preventing it from fully opening and thus creating a functional mitral stenosis. Here is a cardiac MRI in which the regurgitant jet from the aortic valve appears to inhibit the full opening of the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve, creating a functional mitral stenosis. Here is the same MRI slowed down to one-third the prior speed. I would like to note that there are several competing alternative theories regarding the origin of the Austin Flint murmur, including vibrations of the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve, even in the absence of a functional stenosis per se. And there is reasonable evidence that the formation of this murmur may actually invoke a complex combination of related pathophysiologic processes that could not have been envisioned by Dr. Flint. So now what's the evidence of the auscultatory findings? That is, do these murmurs and abnormal heart sounds have described sensitivities and specificities that will allow us to accurately incorporate these findings into the diagnostic formulation that we subconsciously use at the bedside? First, let's start with a classic diastolic decrescendo murmur. In Steve McGee's excellent physical exam textbook, Evidence-Based Physical Diagnosis, he summarizes the reported sensitivities and specificities of these findings and lists a sensitivity of 54 to 87% and specificity of 75 to 98%. He further calculates pooled likelihood ratios, providing a negative likelihood ratio of 0.3 and a positive likelihood ratio of 9.9. .9. Therefore, the presence of this murmur very strongly argues for the presence of aortic regurgitation, while the absence of the murmur only modestly argues against its presence. This is very consistent with my personal bedside experience. Next, let's look at the Austin Flint murmur. The evidence in the literature regarding the test characteristics of the Austin Flint murmur is somewhat less compelling than that for the classic decrescendo murmur at the upper sternal border. Estimates of the murmur sensitivity are all over, ranging from 25 to 100%. In my personal experience, I think a sensitivity of 25% may even be generous. There are no reliable reports of the murmur specificity. Aortic regurgitation has been associated with a large number of physical signs related to the increased pulse pressure it generates. As mentioned earlier, these signs are almost solely seen in chronic aortic regurgitation and not the acute regurgitation that can accompany endocarditis or aortic dissection. Although an increased pulse pressure itself is frequently observed and mentioned in many review articles, it appears to be little studied and there is no reported sensitivity or specificity for it. Furthermore, one study which examined 56 individuals with aortic regurgitation of varying degree of severity found no correlation whatsoever between the pulse pressure and the severity of regurgitation. There are at least a dozen physical findings associated with the bounding pulses of AR. Let's run through some of them quickly now. Corrigan's pulse, a rapidly swelling and falling radial pulse accentuated by wrist elevation. De Rosier's sign, a systolic and diastolic bruit heard when the femoral artery is partially compressed. The diastolic component essential for the sign to be present is caused by backward movement of blood through the femoral artery as blood empties from the aorta back into the left ventricle. De Musset's sign, an anterior posterior head bob with each heartbeat. Interestingly, this is one of the few physical findings named after a patient. In this case, it was the 19th century French poet Alfred de Musset who died of complications of aortic insufficiency brought on by syphilis. Quinky's pulse, capillary pulsations in the fingertips. This is a particularly awful sign, and even Dr. Quinky himself apparently realized shortly after describing it that it also occurs in a large number of perfectly normal individuals. 
Hill sign, popliteal systolic pressure exceeding brachial systolic pressure by more than 60 millimeters of mercury. Mueller sign, systolic pulsations of the uvula. Traub sign, a pistol shot double sound heard over the femoral arteries with compression. Rosenbach sign, systolic pulsations of the liver. Gerhard sign, systolic pulsations of the spleen. And finally, Becker sign, visible pulsations of the retinal arterioles. People are actually coming up with more of these all of the time. There's actually a recently described Lincoln sign named after none other than the 14th President of the United States. According to the story, Lincoln noticed that his foot was unexpectedly blurry in a photograph and pointed it out to a friend who suggested it could be because of throbbing of the arteries in the leg, causing the foot bob during the relatively long exposure time required of photography of that era. President Lincoln reassumed the same pose, seated with his left foot crossed over his right, and noted that yes, indeed, his left foot bobbed ever so slightly with the heartbeat. As Lincoln is suspected of having Marfan syndrome, and therefore was at an unusually high risk of developing aortic regurgitation, the Lincoln sign was born. Whether or not this proves to be helpful in clinical practice, I can't say. I'd like to finish by quickly discussing the evidence behind these eponymous physical findings. A fantastic review article in Annals of Internal Medicine in 2003 reviewed the literature evidence behind some of the eponymous signs just mentioned. Here's a summary of their findings. NSE stands for No Significant Evidence. As you can see, there was either an extreme range of sensitivities and specificities reported, or no high-quality evidence at all for all of these signs, with a possible exception of a reasonably high specificity of the Hill sign. Of the signs which this particular group did not explicitly discuss in this review, I have personally never come across convincing evidence as to the accuracy or usefulness of any of them in clinical practice. I hope you have found this lecture on the physical findings of aortic regurgitation both interesting and useful. Once again, this is Eric Strong of the Palo Alto Veterans Hospital and Stanford University. Thank you.